I love the real or not real moment in the movie. I love that moment throughout the whole film. And I'm wondering, since you guys have been working together for so long now, if each of you could say something about yourself and the other two guess if it's real or not real. <laughs> and so I was thinking, you know, you can start and they have to guess if it's real or not real. It's something just absolutely crazy about yourself that they would only know if they're your friend. Oh, man. Um... I feel like I know you so well that I want to come up with your own real or and not And see if I know it? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. no? I don't okay. even think that works. Um, I, I, I can, <laughs> I can, it's really I can juggle. Yeah. I can juggle. You can juggle. It's real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also love cinnamon rolls. I do love cinnamon rolls. <laughs> um, I... Once open mouth kissed a horse. True. <laughs> <laughs> That's true? No. Uh oh. Don't, no. don't pull that because you're here. It's not just cameras. I really didn't open up kiss a horse. They're just wow. pretending like it's real. Okay, okay. Really yeah. on horse. TV. Like, uh oh, this is amazing. Yeah. I, was so, so I love <laughs> these guys. They're the best. <laughs> and uh, and you have something crazy about you that's that they have to guess real or not real. Uh, so you can totally lie right now if you wanted to. Yeah. I'm, I'm a really good cook. You are a that's good girl. Real. Yeah, it is real. What do you think? Like, well, it's kind of half real. I'm not that good. What, what's a special dish that you make in the Hemsworth household? Make pecan pie. I did make uh, my first pecan he pie. He didn't eat it, though. I didn't eat it, no. That was I, so well, eating I, disorder. <laughs> yeah. No, it he was the end of the night, it. and I made it, and... I didn't need it. I learned the next one. What a cool story. Yeah. You know, I've been doing this for 10 years, and it's an honor to sit across from you for the fourth time, because I've never done a full franchise before for any of my interviews. And you guys have been the kindest people to ever talk to. You guys have, Aww. every single time, you've been so nice to me. And I want to ask you, looking back at the franchise, do you remember the first scene you shot in the first movie, and the last scene you shot in this movie, and how you've each changed throughout that period? I do. What was the, the first scene? I mean, the first scene, I don't know if you shot before me, but the first scene that I ever shot was the one where I threw the bread to you in that flashback. Oh, cute. In the rain. Like, that was like the. I shot for the earlier whole thing. that day. I yeah. shot in the bathtub that they never ended up using. Oh, yeah. Really? Um, getting ready for the games. Yeah. Yeah, and I punched the window and it sh the whole thing shattered. She's like, watch there was this. like a, a beat. <laughs> and I was like, I got it! <laughs> and the whole oh, window smash. shattered. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, then <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then I beat my chest like a gorilla. <laughs> the last scene I, I shot was like a pickup of me putting you out of, of, of When You're on Fire in the final movie. That, that was, was your like, last that scene? Was, that was like a pickup shot on top of a roof here in Berlin. Oh. Yeah. No, our last scene was our babies. Oh, well, yeah, that's true. In the meta. Yeah, that's true. And the babies lot, were actually your nephews. They're my nephews. How did that come about? Did you... Did you was I pimped them out. You, <laughs> did you plan that with Francis? Was I that did, yeah, well, because ever you know, they... Um, Ever, the, the bear, the first nephew, was born when we were doing the first Hunger Games. So this has been his destiny for a long time. <laughs> That's awesome. And Liam, real quick, And then first, we ended up getting more nephews. The, so. the first scene I shot with Jennifer was where I come out of the woods uh, and we're hunting or something like that. Blocked it out. Remember in Asheville? <laughs> no, nope. Remember the, remember the nope, woods? Nope. And then on the side of that hill when we're talking about the, the hot foot forest That's moment. That's not true. <laughs> hot forest moment. Remember that? That so was your first scene? That was, well, that was, it was that day. That was a pre-shoot when we, when we had to wake up at like three uh, in the morning. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because the sun had to come up like in the scene. The spinning shot uh, where Prim and Katniss oh, are dancing. Yeah. Right. And the shot itself, like it looks like they're spinning first and then the camera spins. How, can you talk about how you did that? It's an incredible shot. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, the, this was something that's a little different from the book. So we had this idea that the wedding, at the wedding when Katniss gets the idea that she's going to run off to the Capitol even though nobody wants her to, and she starts to dance with her sister, she knows that she's probably going to go off and die. And so that she wants to hug her sister, it becomes kind of a goodbye. Hmm. And so they start to dance, and I have a steady, our steady cam operator, our a camera operator, would go into the dance that we had choreographed with the actors and all the extras and start to swirl around. And then at a certain moment, Katniss sort of just stops and has to kind of grab a prim. And then we kind of just keep circling around, but we get closer and closer and closer uh, as they hug. And the hug just becomes a great goodbye. And then you've got, of course, their theme that starts to play over it. And it's, yeah, it's a moment I'm very proud of. Her breakdown scene is one of the most yeah. incredible emotional moments I've seen. She's been holding that in the, basically the entire series. Yeah, exactly. And then she lets it out. Uh, the scene when she's throwing things at the cat, was the cat CG? How'd you get to sit there? Was it really not there? How'd you do that? We shot, we shot the cat the, the cat separately. So the, obviously the cat was there for scenes with her so she could interact with it and she could pick it up. But of course, we never really want to throw things at the cat. <laughs> right. So what we did was 
we knew the angle we were going to use to throw the things at the cat. And then I actually had a second unit go in the next day with the cat. And they shot for, I want to say, like two days <laughs> because the cat was really tricky. So you'd get the cat at the window, get it to look in the right way so it looks like it's looking at her. And then they would make sounds to get it to react and look to different places as if something was smashing or breaking nearby. And they spent, I'm serious, two full days just shooting this one angle of this cat. Wow. And then she wasn't actually even throwing anything. So she was just faking throwing things and then we added a digital cup. So the digital cup hits the sink and bounces off and kind of breaks against the wall and then the image of the cat looks up. Wow. That and we just is, put it all together. That's so, amazing. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite scenes in the whole film is the is the moment when Hamish uh, sits down with her and reads her that letter. And I, and I know that was originally a Philip Seymour Hoffman moment. Um, when, when, I know, obviously, since he passed away, when how did you decide that it was going to be Hamish who, because in the the scene itself was Philip Seymour Hoffman saying these things to Jennifer right. Lawrence. How did you decide that it was going to be Hamish reading a letter to him? Whose decision was that? Yours, Suzanne's? You know, the idea, the idea came from Suzanne, you know, and it was surprising how quickly it happened. You know, we, we found the news, we found out about his death on Sunday. It was a Super Bowl Sunday while we were in the middle of shooting. And Phil was actually supposed to shoot the next day on Monday. And of course, you know, we weren't going to be able to do that. So we shut down for the day and we had a big meeting on that Sunday afternoon after we found the news and tried to just figure out what we were going to do. I mean, emotionally for the crew and cast, but also physically with production. Like, what scenes does he have left? And we saw there were one, one scene for Mock and G1, one scene for two, mm. and a handful of appearances in other scenes. And Suzanne very quickly said, um, Hamish should bring her a letter. And it seemed like it made sense. It's, it always seems like he's the mentor. He'd be the one to come visit her. Um, and it also made perfect sense because she never wants to read anything that, that uh, Plutarch would send right. so that he would have to read it rather than her just taking it and reading it there. Um, and so it just seemed to work to work perfectly. All right, that sewer scene is one of the most incredible scenes I've ever seen in my entire life. I think Francis shot that so wonderfully. When you were shooting that moment, what did it look like for you? Were those monsters really there? What, well, what was that CG? How did that look when you were shooting? They were stunt guys dressed yeah, up in uh, body was, capture suits. I, I was met by the friendly faces of the stunt team. You know, <laughs> so as much as they were meant to be very, very scary, I, they, most of them were smiling because they're doing what they love to do. Hmm. Um, but it, it was a very, 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 very tough day. Um, not, I, I speak not only for myself, but for the stunt guys, as well as for Francis, I'm sure. <laughs> it took but, like three weeks, that sewer sequence. We yeah, were from the beginning to the end, yeah. And Francis says it was the hardest for him as well as us, because morale, we were wet all the time. They tried to warm the water, but that just kind of made it a bit humid mm. So as well. So we were cold, wet, like it, it was very dark. We were a bit claustrophobic. Like Francis really had to fight to keep up morale. Mm. And he, yeah. he was feeling it a bit, I think, at that point. Do you remember the first scene you shot in the first film that you were in of the series and the last scene you shot uh, in the series? Uh, it was the training room yeah. in Catching Fire and everyone was so nervous because it was like this big reveal and we'd been all training to kind of get these bodies that we weren't really sure that we were supposed to have and 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 then yeah they like changed my sequence and I was supposed to be fighting someone and then I was fighting no one and I was like ah um, You're fighting so, the floor. Yeah, so, I like, <laughs> so I just like <laughs> so I was like, I don't know, it felt really strange. And then the last one was um, a very defining scene. God, it was the, it was this, the table. You yeah, were yeah, no, oh, the voting I was, scene. I've already passed. Passed over. Um, in Mockingjay <laughs> Part Two, it was when we were all deciding the vote. Yeah, and, and for me, my, my first scene was uh, again the training center, but it was it was a scene that got cut from Catching Fire. Uh, where I'm teaching Katniss how to tie a noose, hmm. um, uh, and similarly nerves, anxiety, um, but and then my last scene was us running over railway tracks in Berlin, oh. um, oh. which did make the movie proud. <laughs> um, but it, it, yeah, that, that, that was, it was quite a quite a sort of, a of unglamorous day day really. Uh, my first scene was being lowered down in a crane on a hovercraft down to District 8 to meet Paler. We had fire everywhere. It was amazing. It was like, wow, welcome, welcome to the Hunger Games. Fire <laughs> everywhere. 
And last day was a couple of days after Sam's last day, again running, lots of running in Mocking J2, yeah. um, through the snow on the way to Tigris. That's awesome. I know movies are shot non-linearly, and did you, did you really shave your head for that, for that, for those shots? Yeah. In, because that was like, if you didn't, that was the most realistic looking shaved head I've ever seen. Yeah, I didn't. I've actually shaved my head twice before, so but I how was did like they... ready, but they were like, no, no, we need you to like, you know, go back and forth in time and have different levels of But they had stu head. there was stubble. Like how do they yeah. make it look like there was Oh, it was intense. There's a whole thing that you do. You stick metal in your mouth, and there's a machine what? that like pumps like is this stubble. How you, is this how you grow hair? On your, this... on your, on your <laughs> thing, on your head. It's like this really weird thing, and I thought I was being electrocuted, and so I couldn't actually use it anymore, and they had to like fake it after that day. It, it was the most realistic shave I've ever seen, a uh, fake shave I've ever seen on yeah, a head before really in my amazing. life. it's what you can do with CG. I mean, we did a full bald cap and CG. And you know they image tracked it so that it all kind of made sense. Whereas Nat didn't get away with that. She right. She had the shape. But you're just cool. Let's talk about this. I've never asked a question like this before in an interview. How do they do the lashes that stuck out? <laughs> I, I'm not a fashion They're, person. Yeah. So that blew my mind. What? What? How did wow. they do that? Like, I was like, I was like, how are they not falling off? Like, I, I kept glue. like focusing on them. I was like, yeah. what? What were those? Glue. It's glue. glue. It's glue. Yeah. Yeah. It's all it is. Were you just able to blink naturally or did you have to think about yeah, blinking? Yeah, I mean you feel them for a long time yeah. and then after a while you just are used to it and they just kind of like flutter on your face and you try not to whack them yeah. like they're a bug. I was wondering if you could take me back to the first scene you shot in the first films that you were in and then the last scene you shot and kind of how you change as an actor or an actress over those years. My first scene was the introduction of President Coyne where I have to kind of come in in my gray jumpsuit and uh, introduce myself to Katniss. And the, the interesting thing about, about Coyne is that initially she's very, very unassuming. Um, so you have to be presidential at the same time that you also seem like you're one of the people. So I remember that was a big challenge, but also, um, there were all these actors in, in the scene, you know, actors from the other movies. So it was really exciting for me. And I was, I, they were so inclusive. Mm. It, was a, it was a great way to start. And your last scene? Hmm. Okay, we can't talk about it. Can yeah, we? I can't really talk about my last scene. But, but, but <laughs> oh, that let's, was the last but scene? But let's say, no, 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 that was the first scene. But the, but the last scene, let's no, the say. The last scene was close to the last scene, though. Yeah, it was. I really yeah. complete. Oh. I do definitely complete my arc. I mean, that was what was great about it, is that I start somewhere and end somewhere else. It's very, very different. Interesting. And for you, mm -hmm. the, do you remember the first scene you shot? I do. You know, the, the thing for me, the very first scene I shot, which was the first reaping in the first film. Um, I, it was all about her voice. I had gone back and forth with Gary Ross about what Effie Trinket sounded like because we were establishing the accent of the capital mm -hmm. and, you know, it was like, is it this? Is it this? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a live mic and it was sort of like once I heard it projected and that Gary Ross, who was the director of the first film, sort of said, I think that's it. I think that's it. She's very actually kind of small but then it's projected and it was really interesting to find her voice on that day I was so scared that it was not going to come to me what it was supposed to sound like but we found it and <laughs> now she's just crazy and it's all worked out yeah you know you speak to a lot of uh, I speak to a lot of actors who when they play a quote-unquote villain in a movie they'll say that I don't consider him a villain because I have to justify what he's doing in order to become him on camera do you feel, the, I mean, I don't know if you feel the same way, do you feel like you have to justify Snow's moments and what he's saying? I mean, do you have to go there mentally and, and understand why he's doing what he's doing? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, he is. I mean, he's, uh, you know, he's, he lives inside me. I, 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 I go to the toilet with him. I mean, uh, so I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, he... Uh, He's, he does what he has to do. He's a total, totalitarian, an oligarch, mm -hmm. and he's ruling a country. He's pragmatic. Uh, he's very frank, and he's absolutely truthful. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't. I don't think of him as, and he doesn't think of himself as bad or good, or mm -hmm. you know. He just, uh, but he does justify himself to her, mm -hmm. and he says. Uh, you know, I, I'm not wasteful. Yeah. I don't kill people unnecessarily. 
expeditiously. Now, I've been talking to you for, for these years, and I've been following your work since I was a kid, and I love the work you've done in your career. But filmmaking and television shows have changed so much since you first started off in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I want to ask you, what is the biggest difference you see in the filmmaking process that from then to now? Interviews. Hmm. Uh, other than that, uh, you know, you come and you perform a character. Hmm. You participate in the film. That, that hasn't really altered uh, the mechanism of a of a digital camera or a, an unblimped Aeroflex, that's, that's obviously different. Mm. The difference between the 200R Panavision and the original 185 is 15 degrees more shutter, that's different. But other than that, no. I love that kind of stuff. I, I miss I miss 35 millimeter film. I love film so much, but obviously everything's digital now. It still looks great though. Um, but the thing with digital is that the magazine is 56 minutes long. Right. So that they don't stop mm. and uh, me, because I was brought up on 35 millimeter and an 11 minute magazine, and a, whatever it was, some, sometimes really long to change magazines, uh, they didn't waste film. Hmm. They would cut, and when they cut, you would re-prepare, and then you would re-slate. And I still get them to cut that digital film and re-slate. Because cool. it gives you a, an ability to prepare, to perform. As we're sitting here, you've wrapped these movies, do you miss him? Do you want to go back to it? I mean, obviously we won't, but I mean, do you, do you miss no. him at all? No, no, that's like making love and you have a, your wife becomes pregnant. You spend the next nine months waiting for that baby and that's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the reaction that young people have to this film to see whether or not it catalyzes them and gets them off their ass and organizes them politically, whether they recognize that they have to do something to save this world, otherwise we are all dead, the earth included. James Newton Howard's score is one of the most incredible scores I've heard him do in his entire career. I actually sat through the entire ending credits, whatever, it was like 10 minutes long, just yeah. so I could listen to the rest of the score. Oh, right. You know, you have such an arc with the characters, but you have such a great arc with his score as well, and do you direct a score as you would direct an actor? I know he's writing the music, but obviously it has to be thematic and, and tonally take us through the storyline. Do yeah. you direct him a little bit like an actor? I, I do, I mean, it starts before he even gets involved, you know, because we have music editors that get involved in the, in the edit, and music editors have a vast knowledge of film music, of actually source music, but film music and all of that. And I start to talk to them at that point about the scenes and sequences you know, per reel and we start to build the feeling of a score. Mm. When we get to a movie like this, luckily we also have three other movies worth of scores um, that we can use so we can start to use some of our own. So we can start to layer in some of the existing themes when, when needed and sometimes we use other things. And so we start to get a sense of what the emotional value of the music is going to be at that stage, then James comes in, I show him the movie, and then I'll talk to him about, hey, this piece of temp score I really like because it does this. And sometimes there'll be a back and forth, sometimes it, we just get it. Sometimes we use a piece from one of the other movies and then it ends up you know, going straight through and we re-record it, but it's still that theme. And then sometimes he will say, hey, you didn't have any music on this thing, but I really think that I can do something let me try, and then he'll do something. And so there's, there's a great back and forth. So it's quite like working with an actor.